welcome to LSC. My name is Jacob and in today's video we will be going over five different Canadian revolutions that you probably didn't know about. In order from the earliest date to the most recent date, as in the most recent year. Number one. So going in, um, the first one we're going to talk about today is the Upper and Lower Canada Rebellion of 1837, uh, ranging from 1837 to 1838. Now, this revolution was the Upper and Lower Canada Rebellion of 1837, kicked off in December of 1837. Basically what happened is the rebels in what is now called Ontario, which of course was referred to as Upper Canada at the time, mounted an insurrection by the British government after agitators in Quebec. Now they uh, took up arms in the same cause the month prior. So basically you had Upper and Lower Canada um, amassing rebels against the British government. Now at this time it's important to remember that these were British colonies. All through the area was British and previously before that it had been um, uh, French colonies as well. Now over the years a lot of the residents that lived in the area came to really resent their absent leaders. Now, obviously, um, the British, the British colonies, the British government, um, it was a monarchy, right? So all of, like the king, um, the queen, and stuff like that, they they were far away off in in, in England, and uh, in, in the Quebec uh, colonies and in the, in the French colonies, of course, their king was was also in, in France, so, so very far away very detached with the needs and the, the, the wants of what people actually cared about um, over in, uh, in, in Upper Canada and Lower Canada. Um, basically the needs were not being fulfilled by their distant rulers. So as a consequence many of them were calling for a democratic style of governments um, similar to the one that had been established recently in America. So now many historians um, are argue about this, but um, a lot of them would view the 1836 rebellion as one event that happened in, in uh, as the um, all encompassing for the Atlantic revolution as well. Uh, during which uh, many North American colonies sought autonomy and democratic ideals. So obviously at this point, you know, um, the American style of, of governance w was very, very appealing to, to uh, the people up in the north, north of the border. Now the Atlantic Revolution was something that took many, many years. Um, in fact, it almost was a hundred years. Um, as I had mentioned, most pe people, mis most, like most historians, would consider it to have kicked out around 1836 to 1837. Um, but you could include the Atlantic Revolution um, as, as the American Revolution in 1776, the French Revolution in 1779, and the Haitian Revolution in 1804, among others. Um, so there was a lot of turmoil at that point in time. A lot of people were getting very frustrated with the um, dictator-style monarchies from afar. Their leaders had no stake um, in it and, and no skin in the game. They did not care at all about what was going on. And people had had enough. Um, the military was uh, causing martial law, they were enacting martial law in many other places. Um, of course, there was a very famous 
incident that happened, uh, the um, you know the Boston massacre in the states, and uh, it it was a it was a very um, it was a very eccentric time to be in. It was a very um, you know. Uh, and, and this is why we have North America now, you know, is because of these revolutions. So I believe that they played a crucial role in, in what we now call Canada and, and, and America, right? And, and even Mexico. And stuff. So, like, it was very important. Now, this idea of democracy had already been sweeping through uh, North America, modern day North America, um, at this point for quite some time. Um, but what is not generally known about this period of time is that sentiment was actually being felt all across Europe as well. Um, it is, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of different stories that talk about how um, uh, in North America and stuff like that, um, the 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 people in Europe basically had, had heard of the, this idea of democracy. Now, the idea of democracy is not a new thing. Um, you know, the Romans, for example, had, um, you know, they, they had a, 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 a semi-democratic republic. Um, it wasn't exactly the same as what we see today, but that was certainly the precursor for it as well. Um, Greece as well was one of the very first um, nations to uh, come up with this idea of, of democracy, um, which at the time was a very, very unpopular idealism, um, you know, uh, but, but they pushed forward with it, right? And, uh, and, and so this was a huge stepping stone. The hostilities between the British colonies and the rebels happened in Lower Canada. It was all kicked off and it had been inflamed at newspaper reports that taxes collected from the sweat of the residents themselves were lavished upon the sons of aristocracy um, for their elite education which was denied to re uh, the very residents own sons and daughters. Now, um, obviously, you know, even today we, we, we have this uh, same inequality as well. Um, but this is a this was a big thing with them. Now, Canadians also reported being treated with contempt and insult. Elections grew so heated that blood was shed several times, and several Canadians were killed by British militiamen. Uh, colonists outlined their grievances and draw up a list of 90 demands that is sent to London and ultimately it was refused. Now these events culminate uh, in massive public demonstrations, upwards of 5,000 colonists protesting at a time. Now, this is when the population, of course, was, was considerably lower, right? So that's quite the demonstration. Uh, now, leaders urged the colonists to set up their own local governments, and some even called for armed insurrection. Now, this is when, of course, the colonists had had enough. Violence broke out across Lower Canada, and civil war was underway. Colonist and patriot William Little Mac Leon Mackenzie uh, organized an attack on Toronto while British troops were engaged fighting elsewhere. And he had a plan to set up a provisional government to take over the city. While he was marching to their, uh, to their uh, intended field of battle, the rebels were ambushed by 20 British militiamen. The Canadian force was much greater and they returned fire. Now this is all happening in what is modern day Toronto. However, the fighting took place at night when visibility was poor. This led to 
to rebel troops mistakenly thinking their troops were being slaughtered when they were merely lying down to reload their weapons, and the Canadian rebels scattered into the woods. For a second try at trying to capture Toronto. He arranged a clandestine meeting at Montgomery's Tavern. 1,000 British soldiers descended upon the tavern. Now, 1,000 British soldiers descended upon the tavern headquarters for the rebels and burnt it to the ground, killing or capturing the majority of the rebel force. Now, Mackenzie and several others were spared by escaping south into the United States, and this marked the official end of the Upper Canada Rebellion. While this was a short duration, these rebellions played a significant role in the formation of Canada as a nation in 1867 and eventual independence in 1931. Number two. Now, this one here coming up next is the Canadian independence. Now, this one isn't technically a rebellion of sorts, um, but you could consider it a rebellion, and that's why it makes this list. Um, and generally speaking, it is a very important, uh, it, it's probably the most important time in Canadian history. Now, the date that a country becomes a sovereign nation should be relatively easy to pinpoint, especially if it's occurring in the modern age. But, of course, like everything that Canada does, it's got to be complicated, right? And it turns out it is. Because it really depends on who you ask, because historians and, uh, and many other people are very divided on this issue. Now, we just recently, a few years ago, celebrated our one 150th anniversary of becoming a country. Some historians point to being granted the right to self-governance in 1867. Now, of course, most official sources will tell you that 1867 is the birth of Canada. However, this is highly con contended. Others would point to the 1919 Treaty of Versailles at which Canada signed as a sovereign nation. For the first time, we were officially separate from Great Britain as its moment of independence. So, were we independent? Depending on who you ask, there's more to this story. While well, Canada entered World War I <clears throat> as a British colony and was automatically at war with Germany, when Great Britain declared war. Now, the, um, the treaty that was signed at the end of the Great War saw Canada exercising its autonomy and independence for the first time on a global stage. And further, further still, some may point to 1965, when Canada adopted the Maple Leaf flag. At this point, we did away with the red ensign, carrying the British arms that had adorned the Canadian symbol of identity as its visual declaration of independence uniting the whole of Canada. Now, obviously, you would think that that would be the end of it because, obviously, we got a flag, right? Despite these epic events in Canadian history, Canada did not enjoy full legal autonomy until the Statute of Westminster was passed on December 11th, 1931. So the Statute of Westminster granted full autonomy to the once British colonies of Canada, Newfoundland, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and the Irish Free State. Now, perhaps not as well known as some of the historic events listed earlier in this, the Statue of Westminster 
is Canada's own Declaration of Independence. A lot of people are very familiar with the Declaration of Independence for the United States, um, but not many of you are actually aware of this, um, that, this is, that that was our Declaration of Independence. So the question is, if we declared our um, independence, you know, at this point in time, in, in 1931, why is it that we consider 1867 as Canada's first independence? However, the statue of Westminster is arguably a more momentous occasion in Canada's journey to sovereignty. The statute granted Canada independence from British regulations and freedom to pass, amend, and repeal laws with an autonomous legal system, and gave the Canadian government the independence it needed to build a legislative foundation upon which Canada still stands today. Now, Canada still holds a lot of the same traditions that the monarchy did have. Um, we still consider our uh, we still consider our figurehead of our country, for example, uh, to be the queen. Right, the queen is our head of state. The um, our national police force, the RCMP, the um, well known as the Mounties. Uh, they swear an allegiance, they swear an oath to the Queen and to the Crown, not to Canada. Uh, the same thing goes for Canadian Forces officers as well. Um, when you're in the Canadian Forces, you swear an oath to protect the Crown and the Queen and their heirs, okay, the royal, the royalty. So, you're not really swearing to defend Canada, you're defending the Crown. This is very important to note. Many different police departments, almost every single police department in Canada, makes that same oath as well to the Crown. When we have, um, when we actually have uh, like our court system and stuff like that, our prosecutors are actually called the Crown. Okay, they're Crown prosecutors. They are the lawyers of the Crown. Okay, so they don't represent Canada or the provinces, they represent the crown. When we have corporations that are owned by the country, we call them crown corporations. Another example is if you're on a military base anywhere in Canada, you will definitely see a picture of the queen hung up somewhere. In, in an office somewhere or, or in the entrance somewhere in somewhere in uh, on the base you're going to see uh, pictures of the Queen um, whereas in the states their head of state is their president right so their commander-in-chief of the military is also the president so therefore they have the president's picture up which is the leader of their country now we don't have our prime minister up on, on the uh, on the wall we have the Queen now of course if you look at our money you will also see that we have the Queen on the back of our coins this also indicates that we are still very heavily tied to the monarchy now in my opinion I believe that Canada will never truly be free of the crown and, uh, and, and be a free country and be our own independent country until we get rid of the crown in all of the wording and everything throughout Canada. Number three. Now, coming up next, we have what was referred to as the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution occurred over a number of years. In 1947, a Vancouver woman named Viola Woodridge uh, was murdered by her husband. During the course of her husband's murder trial, the court decided that Viola was such a poor mother 
and an inadequate wife that she was put on trial for her own death. Just imagine uh, you're dead and they still take you to court. Well, it was in Vancouver, so... Now, so the charges against her husband were dropped as Viola was deemed such a lacking example of Canadian womanhood that he couldn't be held accountable for her death. By the 1960s, the women's liberation movement and feminism would challenge Canada's patriarchal order. Up until that time, women's bodies were considered vehicles of population growth by some to be the quasi-property of the state. The mainstream view at the time had little tolerance for anything other than heterosexual marriage and sex for the sole purpose of reproduction. At this time, um, people were very, very religious as well. As Viola Wood Woolridge's death would prove women in defiance of this social convention could pay with their lives. At the start of the 20th century, failing fertility rates led to concerns over eventual availability of soldiers needed for the impending Great War. Birth control would remain illegal under the criminal code until the reforms of 1969. Middle-class couples were evidently practicing some type of birth control, but due to its outlawed status, they lacked professional medical advice. The first family planning medical clinic opened in Hamilton in 1932, but operated illegally until the late 60s. Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau didn't create the sexual revolution in Canada, but he was its public, legal, and political catalyst. He famously said, the state has no business in the bedroom of the nation. As both a federal justice minister and prime minister, his business was dismantling existing models of sexual property and destruction of millennia of enforced Judeo-Christian values. And as you can see, the new Prime Minister, uh, his son, um, Justin Trudeau, has definitely followed that model of um, going against uh, uh, Judaism and, and, and Christian values, whether that be a personal attack or not. Who knows? But. Um, it does seem to be a reoccurring theme when it comes to the Liberals. With an ongoing and continued litigation involving claims of sexual harassment, workplace impropriety, and what is deemed proper sexual behavior for Canadians, this revolution can be said to be very much in existence if less obvious than it is of its counterparts in the 1960s, it's definitely very much alive to this day. Now, obviously, we today we have what's called the Me Too movement. Um, there is very much, uh, quite a lot of um, uh, different movements and different groups and different things, such such as it will. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's it's uh, it's pretty much still alive today. That being said, of course, we have. A tremendous right, uh, amount of rights when it comes to uh, women's rights or uh, LGBTQ rights or anything like that. Um, today, if you compare uh, it to back then, yes, we, we've come a long way since then. Number four. Okay, so now coming up next, we have the rights revolution spanning from 1945 to 1982. Almost 40 years ago in the making, the rights revolution in Canada 
refers to the time period between the end of World War II and in 1945 and the signing of the Canadian Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms in 1989. Now, activists at the grassroots level representing many marginalized groups, such as women, LGBTQ communities, indigenous peoples, and individuals with disabilities, it wasn't until the provincial and federal governments joined the fight that real and significant change would take effect. World War II and the atrocities committed against many marginalized people became known on a global scale. In addition to those of the Jewish faith and race, people with physical, mental, or emotional disabilities were included. Various races of people of color or considered to be non-white were subjected to the worst kinds of torture, atrocities, uh, many other things, racism, uh, to be inflicted upon the human race in all of history. The popularity of movies and the growing film industry brought those images out of the imagination and onto the big screen in a big way. People were witness to the horrors that occurred in Europe and it led them to ask, in short, it led to increasing sensitivity to people in our own communities who are being marginalized and mistreated. In 1945, the United Nations was formed to legislate human rights on a global scale. Canadian law professor John Peters Humphrey became director of the UN's Division on Human Rights in 1946 and wrote the first draft of an International Bill of Rights that would eventually become the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, or the UDHR. I bet you didn't know a Canadian wrote that. The year prior to the formation of the UN in 1944, Canada would enact the Racial Discrimination Act which banned any publication or display of discrimination against a person, their race, or their beliefs. It's interesting that that long ago, Canada had already taken measures towards this. Not to mention, we are also the ones that uh, uh, were mainly responsible for taking in those of the Underground Railroad as well. But it was Saskatchewan's 1947 act to protect certain civil rights, they introduced the first true Bill of Rights, as it included freedoms of conscious expression and association and the freedom from arbitrary imprisonment as rights to elections, employment, and property, and even education. Over the course of the 1950s and the 1960s, many of the other provincial and territorial legislations followed suit with their own human rights codes. Soldiers returning from Vietnam and the needs of veterans from earlier conflicts would push for deinstitutionalization, <coughs> as would those with disabilities. The LGBTQ activists brought about a decriminalization of sexual relations between men over the age of 21 in 1969 and the ban of on discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Now, indigenous peoples also used human rights language to push for increased political gains and for the rights to resources, land, and self-government. At this time, indigenous peoples made as provincial and federal governments became more receptive to claims by the First Nations people. 
The groundbreaking first law to protect human rights at the federal level, the Canadian Bill of Rights, was introduced by Prime Minister John Diefenbaker in 1960. The Canadian Human Rights Act passed in 1977 and was much more effective in accomplishing its intended aims. In 1982, Canada's constitution was changed to adopt the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. With this, the Charter became the highest law in the land. As a result, the human rights outlined within the Charter superseded the Bill of Rights. Now, for those who don't know, a Charter is a suggestion thereof. So although it superseded the Bill of Rights, um, the Bill of Rights was an actual law, whereas the Charter is more of a suggestion. Um, so unfortunately, the Charter is now um, heavily, depending on who you ask, it, it's uh, definitely been heavily abused and, and, and it's easier now to take advantage of it. Um, because it's open to interpretation, whereas the U.S. Constitution is pretty much set in stone. Um, and uh, they, they have quite a lot of other laws that pertain to how to interpret the uh, U.S. Constitution. Whereas in Canada, the Charter of Rights is very much up for interpretation depending on which lawyer or which judge you're, you're talking to. They may interpret it in very different ways. The Charter of of rights and freedoms um, ended up proposing several suggested rights um, and it influenced how the courts made their decisions. Um, sometimes it was right, sometimes it was wrong, depending again on whatever judge happened to be working that day. Um, really, really varied significantly. Um, the Canadian legal rights of, of people accused of crimes and stuff like that under the criminal code um, varied from day to day and it's used officially in, in everything in, in Canada but um, it's uh, it, it's very it's basically varied on who's looking at the law. Number five. Last but not least um, this one is dubbed the quiet revolution. Now, this one wasn't really that quiet. <laughs> um, some people may actually call this the October crisis is part of the, um, the main height of, of, of this revolution was, uh, was the main height was the October crisis, but we'll talk about that. Basically, so how did this get started? Well, let me tell you. On several separate occasions, Quebec voted to succeed from Canada to become its own autonomous sovereign nation, narrowly being <coughs> defeated by less than 5% of the vote each time. Now, Quebec has a long history of going its own way and marching to the beat of a different drum. This may have its origins in Quebec being gifted to England as part of the Treaty of Paris, after which 55,000 French Canadians became English subjects without their consent, let alone their blessings. Yes, that would probably make me upset as well. To this day, Quebec remains historically proud almost aggressively French. Now I know this from uh, myself from uh, personal experience of living in um, living in Montreal and also living in Ontario. Um, there's a lot of hostility. There's a lot of uh, headbutting. There's a lot of tension between Ontario and <clears throat> Quebec. And really, the West, even Western Canada, um, and and the East, there's quite a bit of tension um, 
anybody that lives in Canada will know this, at least if you're paying attention, you will know this, that uh, there is a tremendous amount of tension between English and French and Eastern Canada versus Western Canada. Um, there's a huge divide of opinions and a huge divide of ideology between the East and West. Rates of immigration to Quebec directly from France was high, with more than 5 million citizens with French ancestry currently inhabiting the province. In fact, 300 years ago, upon its founding, Quebec was initially named New France. The Quiet Revolution describes a period of rapid social and political change experienced in Quebec during the 1960s. Although Quebec was highly industrialized, enterprising, urban, and progressive, the United National Party that had been in power since 1944 was staunchly old-fashioned, as it held um, to its conservative ideology and promoted traditional values that some members felt were very outdated. This was mainly due to the strictness set by the Catholic Church, which was by far the dominant religion and which greatly influenced all aspects of life for Catholics in Quebec. Now, obviously, as someone who has had um, some time living in Quebec, uh, I, I could tell you from personal experience that, um, you know, the Catholic um, influence and the influence of the church is very, very evident um, in, in, in Quebec. Uh, a good example of this um, is that uh, most, if not all, of their swears, I think mo most of them, um, the good majority of the swears, are directly related to the church. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, items within the church, uh, and, you know, the church itself, different things like that. Um, another thing that they do as well is they actually, they don't celebrate um, Canada's Day. Um, they celebrate Saint Jean Baptiste. Um, you know, Saint Jean Baptiste is, uh, you know, a, a French uh, saint. Um, so they, uh, you know, again with the theme of, of Catholicism. You know, so it very it, it shows how much it is a very much part of their lives. However, in the elections of June 1960, the Liberals broke the hold of the United National, winning the election and developing a platform based on major reforms as indicated by their slogan, it's time for a change. <laughs> and change they did. As a new middle class battled for greater control over Quebec's economic resources, attempts were made to redefine the role of the Francophone society with Greater Canada. The Quiet Revolution was a plan to introduce deep social and cultural reforms within Quebec. But first, they had to reduce the hold of the Catholic Church upon the people. They did this first by taking control. The Liberals did this first by taking control of education, and social services, and then endeavors fostering creative expansion such as art, film, uh, music, and even cuisine. So obviously the Liberals took complete control of Quebec society. The Liberals worked very hard to get rid of the Catholic Church and to suppress the role that the Catholic Church had in the society and it diminished greatly as they tried to raise prosperity for the French-speaking Quebecois, a nationalist consensusness expanded. The government changed their electoral map to provide a better representation for urban areas, 
and curbed political patronage. Um, so in other words, what they did is basically um, the, the Liberal Party, what they did is they redesigned um, in the 60s, they, they redesigned the political map um, so that Montreal would have a considerably higher um, a considerably higher voting power than all of the western provinces and and every major western city in all of Canada and including all the capitals and major cities in eastern in the eastern atlantic provinces so this obviously was a big shakeup and so now um it's not really um in my opinion i think that this is uh it, it's, it's, it's a very bad decision that they made um, because it makes the... It, essentially what that does is it makes the only two cities in Canada that really, really matter uh, when it comes to politics uh, is Montreal and Toronto because those are the only two cities that have the highest amount of political influence uh, due to their population. Um, so generally speaking, uh, once Montreal and Toronto have voted uh, on a certain uh, subject or, or person, um, it's game over. Uh, the only time that they need a third city um, is if Montreal and Toronto voted in a different direction. If they both voted... Uh, unanimously in a different way um, for two different parties um, then the tiebreaker will be Vancouver um, and so Vancouver has the third largest population and uh, so they are the only other one that is used as a tiebreaker so the only time Vancouver is ever relevant when it comes to voting is when there's a tiebreaker needed to be done. Now, obviously, uh, Montreal has a very long history of voting liberal, um, so they almost always exclusively vote liberal. That's not always the case, but it is uh, a, a certainly a very large trend. Whereas the rest of Quebec tends to vote for um, other parties like uh, National and the FLQ and um, you know, Parti Le Québécois, and, and of course the Bloc Quebec. Whereas um, Vancouver tends to almost exclusively vote either Liberal or um, Green Party or NDP. Generally, they have more people that vote NDP or Green Party than Liberal, um, but uh, that is how the trend seems to be. Agencies were created to improve federal provincial relations and cultural affairs. In 1964, it introduced three major pieces of legislation, an extensive revision of the Labor Code, a bill that abolished a married woman's legal status, which was equal to that of a minor child, and a pension plan was established for senior citizens. But the quiet revolution didn't stay quiet. In fact, in 1963, a separatist militia political group called the Franc de Libération du Québec, or FLQ, allegedly set off bombs in Montreal. Now, at the time, this was absolute fact. And the Canadian government, in fact, listed them as terrorists, much as the Irish um, free, freedom fighters in Ireland. Many years later, it is now known that it was actually, in fact, the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, yes, they actually, it turns out that they 
had a tremendous amount of corruption during this time. In fact, their police commissioner at the time was known to be a communist spy. Oh yeah, it gets deep. So the RCMP, generally what happened was the government at the time, want, the liberal government at the time, they wanted to get rid of the separatists. They wanted to get rid of the idea of Quebec separating and they wanted to get rid of this political group that um, also had a branch of, of militia, which was uh, basically an unsanctioned um, underground uh, military group, right? Um, but it, as it turns out, according to the evidence that has been found, uh, including um, DNA evidence and fingerprint evidence as well, um, it turns out that the RCMP were the ones, in fact, that planted the bombs and they it, basically in an attempt to frame the FLQ into making it seem as though that they were terrorists. Pretty crafty. And that's probably why the RCMP uh, these days, uh, they were um, filled with controversy. But that's another topic for another video. The violence escalated until events known as the October Crisis in 1970. The violence escalated until events known as the October Crisis in 1970, when the FLQ kidnapped a provincial cabinet minister and British diplomat, killing the Labour minister, demanding that Quebec separate from Canada Despite not having a, the widespread support of the people of Quebec, nationalism in Quebec was on the rise. Now, obviously, um, this was, again, allegedly, because, as we find out, the RCMP, again, was involved in the kidnapping as well. Now, we don't know how deep, um, how, how deep the corruption goes or how deep it went, but we do know that a lot of the uh, supposed FLQ members were actually undercover cops. So the idealism of the the Red Mounties, you know, the Red Surge, very tainted. Again, we'll get back into that on another video. When Canada brought home its new constitution in 1982, all nine provinces signed it. All except Quebec, who was in favor of creating its own. The Minister of Culture was established to entice Quebec to join the Canadian fold and still exists to this day. In 1980 and then again in 1995, Quebec would vote on a referendum of separation. The last one was defeated in the slimiest of margins. The last one was defeated in the slimmest of margins. While there is no official date to mark the end of the Quiet Revolution, both the World Languages Act of 1969 and Montreal serving as the World Expo City in 1967 are considered such. The Quiet Revolution was a seminal modern event in the people of Quebec defining themselves and in the French history and their futures as Canadians. Now funny enough thing, right now we are also dealing with here in Alberta the fact that um, many Albertans want to leave Alberta as well but of course, that will be another topic for another video. I just did want to touch on the October crisis a little bit, uh, but um, I've decided that uh, I will make a separate video for the October crisis specifically. So if you want to see that video, um, uh, we will be posting it uh, very shortly as well, um, because that 
uh, the October crisis is a a topic in and itself, um, very political in nature, um, and uh, so you can expect to see that video. Um, it may be on this channel. It may be on the um, YYC News channel as part of a documentary that we're doing. Um, but uh, yeah, so we'll see. I will keep you posted. This has been Legendary Studios Canada, and I'm your host, Jacob. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.